Um, well, good afternoon. On behalf of the Norfolk Records Committee, very pleased to in, um, have Peter Bands here to talk about the Dulip Singh family um, and um, in support of this very excellent expedition ex exhibition he's put on. Um, this uh, event is um, arranged by the Essex Cultural Diversity Project and is a, a third of a series of um, annual events which started off with the festival of the Punjab and Thetford and then the Punjab and Norfolk and this year we're celebrating the festival of the Punjab and East Anglia. So over to you Peter. Thank you. Good afternoon ladies and gentlemen. Um, this afternoon I'll be giving a talk on the life of Maharaja Dalip Singh and his children. And before I talk about the Leap Singh, I'm going to give a little background history into uh, Punjab, how it was in the 18th century, and also touch on Maharaja Ranjit Singh, who was the Leap Singh's father. So without further ado. So in the middle of the 18th century, there was a power vacuum in the Punjab. The ruling Mughal government in central India was crumbling, and the British East India Company were expanding their territory westwards from Bengal, from Calcutta. And from the Middle East, we had we had plundering and looting into India via Afghanistan and India. So the Punjab was like a buffer state between India and the Middle East. And the Sikhs, who were the, the martial race of the Punjab, formed confederacies. Uh, there were 12 such confederacies. Um, these confederacies were known as missiles, um, and they ruled their own section and area of the Punjab. And on, their, on the outset of an outside attack, the 12 would come together as one fighting force and eradicate the enemy. Now, amongst one of the smaller missiles was the Sukhachakya missile. Um, it, although it was small, it had a very inspiring leader called Ranjit Singh, a, a young man who had a vision of consolidating all the other missiles under his own banner. And one by one, he began taking over the other missiles, either by friendship or, or by force. And by 1799, he had taken the capital city of the Punjab, which was Lahore, and in 1801, he was crowned the Maharaja of the region. And here we have a portrait um, showing Maharaja Ranjit Singh at the zenith of his reign. And here we can see an ancestry of Maharaja uh, Dalip Singh. Um, his grandfather was a chieftain called Sardar Mahasingh. And it said, had Mahasingh not met his premature death at the age of 30 years old, he surely would have become the ruler of the Punjab himself. Um, he died at the age of 30 due to an exploding uh, matchlock. He had one son, Ranjit Singh, and Ranjit Singh had seven sons. His most um, famous wife, Maharani Jindgaur, uh, he had his younger son than her, uh, Maharaja Dalip Singh, and he had six other sons from various other queens. And here we can see how Punjab fits in with the Indian subcontinent. Now, the area shaded in pink uh, in this uh, map shows the area of Greater Punjab. So this was the, the area which were controlled by various Sikh states. So not only Ranjit Singh, but also uh, the kingdoms of Patiala, Naba, Jeen, and Kapurthala. And it went right up to Delhi. The area in the red border, in the red outline, shows the kingdom which Ranjit Singh carved for himself, which was approximately the size of Great Britain. And just to give it a, a modern context, the blue line that we see going through the Punjab shows the line of partition. Uh, when India uh, became independent and Pakistan was formed in 1947, the line of partition uh, went through the Punjab and around 75% of Ranjit Singh's territory uh, fell under Pakistan. So by 1805, the British East India Company realized Ranjit Singh as a major powerhouse in the Indian subcontinent. So they sought a treaty, a treaty of friendship. But Ranjit Singh kept expanding his territory at an alarming rate. And by 1809, we had the Treaty of Amritsar, which basically made the River Satluj as the southern border between Maharaja Ranjit Singh's empire and the northern border of British India. So now the Maharaja's southern border was fixed with the British. He concentrated his efforts northwards towards Kashmir and westwards towards the northwest frontier region of the, of, of the Khyber Hills. He ruled for approximately 40 years, um, by which time his kingdom was approximately the size of, of Britain. And after a series of strokes, he dies in 1839. 
And that's when the history of Punjab really gets a little mucky. Because the problem we had, Ranjit Singh had seven sons from seven different wives. And when you have that situation, every mother wants their son to be the ruler. And that's exactly what happened in Punjab. So Ranjit Singh nominated his eldest son, um, Karak Singh, to be uh, next in line. And he came on the throne on Ranjit Singh's death. But within six months of coming to the throne, he was overthrown by his own son, Nornihal Nihal Singh, as Karak Singh was a very weak ruler. A year later, Karak Singh dies from a short illness. And on the day of his father's illness, uh, of his father's funeral, Nornihal Nihal Singh is marching back into the Lahore fort when the masonry of the Lahore fort gate falls upon him and crushes his skull. Now, was this murder or, or was this an accident? We will never know. Ranjit Singh's second son, Sher Singh, put forth his claim to the front of the Punjab. But Chand Gaur, Karak Singh's widow, claimed his, her daughter-in-law, Seb Gaur, was expecting a child. And should that child be a son, he would be the rightful heir to the Punjab. Six months later, she gives birth, but the child is stillborn. But Chand Gaur still refuses to give or hand over power. Sher Singh marches in with a small contingent of his army, overthrows his sister-in-law, takes over the reins of the kingdom, and he pensions his sister-in-law off with a small estate outside of the capital city. Six months later, she too is found dead, apparently killed by her maidservant, and all the fingers pointed towards Sher Singh. So now we see two years of stability under Sher Singh between 1841 and 1843. And what happens in 1843, uh, one afternoon whilst Sher Singh is inspecting a section of his army, he's assassinated by the Sandawaliya Sardars. Now the Sandawaliyas were the cousins of the royal family. And they strongly believed that Sher Singh was involved in the murder of Chandgaur and Sarkaur. So they took their revenge. The Punjab, again, was in turmoil. The remaining five sons of Ranjit Singh put forth their claim to the throne of the Punjab, but the court of Lahore favoured the five-year-old Dalip Singh. And that's because his maternal uncle, Jawahar Singh, yielded great influence in the royal court. And he himself becomes the prime minister. So Dalip Singh ascends to the throne at the age of five. Uh, and as any five-year-old, he enjoys the fruits of his kingdom. Uh, and his uncle, who is now the prime minister, abuses his position. And what he does, he has the other sons of Ranjit Singh, uh, one by one, put to death. Okay. He has the other sons put to death. Now, the, the Sikh army hears about the prime minister's antics, and they summon him to, the, to their camp. Now, Jawar Singh, being a clever man, or thinking he was clever, he takes the young Maharaja with him on his elephant, thinking, the Sikh army will dare not touch me if the Maharaja is present. But how wrong he is when he enters the Sikh camp, he's ordered off his elephant, he's shot, and his head is severed off. His sister, uh, Maharani Jindakor, who is the, the queen mother, uh, the mother of the Leap Singh, can only watch as her brother is brutally killed in front of her very eyes. It is said to punish the Sikh army, she sends her army to the southern border to provoke war against the British. Now, I won't go into the ins and outs of the, the First Anglo War. Anglo-Sikh War of 1845-46, because it really is a, a subject for a talk on its own. But uh, the result was the, the Sikhs uh, were defeated uh, after a very uh, closely fought uh, war. The British East India Company entered the Punjab. They installed a, a resident in the capital city who would look after and administer the kingdom on behalf of the Maharaja until he reaches the age of 16. And for this, they would charge the government, the Sikh government, an annual fee, they would also um, annex or take away the territory of Kashmir and sell this to one of the Dogra rulers um, to pay for the war indemnity, basically the cost of war, which had been, uh, uh, which had, which cost the British dearly after the Sikhs had attacked them. Um, a year later, the Maharani, the Queen Mother, Jindgaur, is removed from the capital city because she keeps meddling in court affairs. And then she's imprisoned in the fort of Janai. In 1848, a small section of the Sikh army rebel in the province of Multan. Now, there's two reasons for the rebellion. Um, first of all, the Sikhs were angered that the Queen Mother had been arrested and imprisoned um, in Janar. And secondly, they believed that the British East India Company were here to stay, and they were not going to hand back the kingdom 
to the Leap Singh when he reached the age of 16. So this small skirmish, which would have quite easily been crushed by the then Governor General Lord Dalhousie, is allowed to escalate. So a full scale battle take place, takes place. Um, he sends in the heavy artillery, um, crushes the Sikh army, uh, and blames them for breaking the treaty of the first Anglo-Sikh war and annexes the Punjab to British India. The Maharaja at the age of 11 is removed from power. And here he is meeting the governor general. Um, at the age of 11 years old, he's allowed to keep the title of Maharaja, Maharaja Dalip Singh Bahadur, um, and has to give up for himself and his ears all rights to the throne of the Punjab. And in return, he will be given a pension of no less than 40 and no more than 50,000 pounds per annum. And if we can see two um, important images of, of early images of Maharaja Dalip Singh, on the left, we see one of the first photographs of Maharaja Dalip Singh. Um, uh, this was taken by an amateur photographer in the British Indian Army. Um, his name was John McCosh, taken in 1849. And on the right side, we see a watercolor by Lady Helen Mackenzie, who was the wife of a British officer and amongst one of the first European ladies uh, to meet the Maharaja. And she really had sympathy uh, for the 11 year old. And here we have Dr. John Logan Spencer, who was a surgeon in the British Indian Army. But the um, Indian Army felt that he could better serve his country as a guardian and father like figure for the Maharaja. And it was his instructions to bring up the Maharaja as a fine Englishman. And his first duties was to take the Maharaja away from the Punjab. And he took him to a place called Fatehgarh Cantonment, uh, which was also known as Fatehgarh Park. And um, this was an establishment for the wives and children of European officers serving in India. Here, the Maharaja was completely isolated from his countrymen. He was introduced to young English schoolboys of his own age, and his schooling uh, would begin in, um, in Fadiga. The Bible was also placed in his hands and uh, yeah, he generally started showing an interest in the Christian religion. And that Bible that was given to him in 1850 in Fadiga is actually on display in the exhibition today. So uh, when, we, when we finish the exhibition, uh, when we finish the talk, I'd be happy to show you uh, that Bible. During the summer months, the Maharaja will be taken on various excursions. He will be taken to see the, the Red Fort at Delhi, um, the Taj Mahal at Agra, and during the, the hotter months, he would be taken to the cooler hill station of Landor, which was uh, near Masuri. And he was kept at this building. I couldn't actually get an image of it close by because it's a, it's a military building now, so you can't get close by. But this is one of the buildings where the Maharaja was kept at his time in Landor. It's during his time in Masuri, the Maharaja expressed a wish of becoming a Christian. And he was baptized within the confines of his house in Fatigar. Um, I've also got an image of an early sketch, which Sir John Logan kept in his uh, notebooks, uh, an early sketch which the Maharaja did during his time uh, in Missouri, and uh, the famous portrait which was done by the Victorian artist George Beachy uh, of the Maharaja in 1853 during his summer months in Missouri. Sir John Logan uh, actually managed to get permission for the Maharaja to travel to England on an educational trip. And he thought this painting would be uh, an ideal gift to the Governor General, Lord Dalhousie, uh, as, a, as a parting gift. And in return, Lord Dalhousie gave the Maharaja his own parting gift, this beautiful leather bound, uh, clasp and inscribed copy of the Holy Bible, which is now on display at uh, Thetford Museum. So the Maharaja was initiated in 1853 or baptized in 1853 and was given permission to travel to, to England with his party. He set sail and he arrived in London in May 1854, where he was given an instant audience with Queen Victoria. She took an instant liking to him. She encouraged him to mix with the royal princes. He had a lifelong friendship with the Prince of Wales, later Edward VII. And he was encouraged to open correspondence uh, with the royal children. And he had an affectionate uh, relationship with the very ill Prince Leopold. And he was even, he even holidayed with the family at Osborne House in the Isle of Wight, where this photograph was taken. Uh, and we believe the photograph was actually taken by Prince Albert, the, the Prince Consort. And the famous portrait of the Maharaja by Franz Winterhalter. Many of you may have seen this picture. Um, it uh, hangs at Osborne House. 
And this is really a, a classic example of 19th century photoshopping, where the Maharaja is made to look much more taller, much more handsome, and much more flamboyant than he really was. The artist had actually hoped the Maharaja would reach this height later in life. But sadly, after the age of 15, the Maharaja never did grow. Um, so it's quite deceiving, this portrait, uh, in regards to the Maharaja. And here we can see the portrait as it hangs in the Darbar Hall at Osborne House in the Isle of Wight, next to a portrait of the Leap Singh's eldest son, Victor the Leap Singh. And here we see uh, a press cutting, a newspaper engraving of the Maharaja, announcing that the Maharaja the Leap Singh is here in England on a tour and an educational trip. But sadly, uh, when arriving in England, the Maharaja was told there was no precedent for a native prince to study in this country. And they felt that he might be thrashed by the other boys. So the matter was dropped. And it really affected the Maharaja because that was one of the main reasons he was told that he was coming to England for. And two portraits were quite important, sorry, two busts which are quite important. Um, the, the bust on the left was commissioned by Queen Victoria of the Maharaja. Um, it was sculpted by Baron Marichetti. And it's actually on display at Osborne House in the Isle of Wight. And on the right hand side is a uh, bust by John Gibson, who was plying his trade in Rome when the Maharaja visited uh, Rome with the Logan family on a European trip. And many of you may actually recognize this bust because in 2007, it came up in auction at Bonhams. And I was doing the cataloging for the auction house. And the 20 to 25,000 pound valuation went through the roof when the hammer fell at 1.7 million pounds. And whilst I was doing the research for this bust, I actually found that the bust for around 20 years was on a pedestal in the front garden of a cottage in Norfolk, in the village of Blow Norton. And for 20 years, nobody batted an eyelid. Nobody ever noticed it. And um, also the owner of that cottage, her son was an alcoholic, and he tried to sell this bust in the local pub for 50 pounds, and there were no takers. <laughs> And around 10 years ago, I was actually giving a talk in the village of Blown Norton. And I told them, I said, this bus came from your village and it was offered to you, you know, to your, to, to, to you guys for 50 pounds, but there were no takers. And suddenly this, this chap stood up and said, excuse me, Mr. Banks, but um, I was offered that bus in the 80s for 40 pounds by Mr. Crow. But I refused it because I thought it was a bit of a voodoo doll. Yeah. So I put the question to him. I said, well, do you not regret? investing 40 pounds, which would have accumulated to 1.7 million. And he said, no, I have no regrets. And I thought, what a liar. <laughs> I would have regretted it. So the Maharaja now became the ideal party accessory, invited to every royal gathering, every royal wedding, every state opening of parliament. And here we can see the Maharaja on the front page of the graphic newspaper, standing behind Queen Victoria at Buckingham Palace. And again, uh, we can see the Maharaja. If I can use this pen, we can just see him standing here. Um, and the Prince of Wales is waiting. And we can see the Maharaja is standing behind the royal princes. So it just so showed he's standing um, as um, head uh, of the foreign royalty whenever there was any formal or uh, royal um, processions and, and events. As the Maharaja's um, trip was becoming more permanent, um, they took up a house at Roehampton for him in London in 1856. And then Sir John Logan took the Maharaja to his native Scotland. And they rented Castle Mengis in Aberfeldy for a period of two years. Here, the Maharaja was initiated into grouse shooting and he became a fine shot. Actually, he was one of the top three shots in the country after the Prince of Wales and Lord de Grey. A more permanent residence, uh, an estate at Whitby was rented for the Maharaja from the Earl of Mulgrave. And it said that uh, whilst he stay at Mulgrave, the Maharaja actually purchased an elephant and would ride around in the village on an elephant. And here we have the Maharaja in 1859. Now, around 1859, the Maharaja had an urge to meet his mother. It had been some 13 years since he had last seen her. He actually found out that whilst she was in a British prison in the, in the, in the fort of Janar, she actually disguised herself as her own maidservant and escaped from prison and traveled through hundreds of miles of populous forest and went to Nepal, where the King of Nepal 
gave her sanctuary. So the Maharaja sent a letter via a native traveling banker. The letter actually was intercepted by British intelligence, but they felt the Maharani was now old, she was frail, and she was virtually blind. And they thought, she's no danger to us now, so let's let mother and son meet up. So in January 1861, the Maharaja travels to India. He's not allowed to go to the Punjab, so it's arranged for him to meet his mother in Calcutta at Spencer's Hotel after a period of 13 and a half years. It just so happened that on this visit, the Sikh army, which was now part of the British Indian Army, were coming back from the China Wall down the river Hooghly, close to the city of Calcutta. And they had heard that the Maharaja was in the capital city. Soon, crowds of Sikh soldiers began gathering outside the hotel, chanting the Maharaja's name, telling him that they are behind him. The British authorities became alarmed. They told the Maharaja, for the safety of the empire, he must go back to England. And if he wished, he could take his mother with him. Dalip Singh was more than happy to take his mother with him. He had spent 13 years without her. And the Maharani was uh, even more happier because she was told that if she chose a place which was given to her by the British and on British territory, her casket of jewels, which was confiscated when she escaped from the prison, would be given back to her. So the Maharaja takes his mother back to England. He gets a house for her. He rents a house for her in London at Lancaster Gate, which was two doors away from Sir John Logan's uh, residence. And there he has George Richmond painter in this beautiful oil painting. And this is the only true depiction we have of the Maharani. Uh, there's several engravings uh, and, and lithographs and sketches which were done without her, but this is a, a real life um, sitting of the, of the Maharani. Sadly, after only 18 months of meeting her son, the frail Maharani passed away in London. Two months later, the Maharaja lost another parent when Sir John Logan died at Felixstowe. Now the Maharaja had hoped that Sir John Logan would be buried in a mausoleum which he was building on the newly purchased Elverdon estate. But Lady Logan felt that Sir John had spent his last happy years in the old seaside town of Felixstowe and it's only right he should be buried in, in, in Felixstowe. So the Maharaja at his own cost built this red and white uh, granite memorial and it is said on the funeral the Maharaja openly wept and said today I've lost my father. That's how high he held Sir John Logan. So in 1863, they, the Maharaja gained permission from the authorities to take his mother's remains back to India for her last rites. At that time in England, cremation was illegal and the Maharani's remains um, were stored in a casket in the catacombs of the dissenters chapel in Kensal Green. So the Maharaja traveled in early 1864 with his mother's um, casket uh, with a hidden agenda of his own. And when he went to India en route, he stopped at Cairo and he visited the American mission school. He'd actually written to the mission school asking, asking them to find him a suitable Christian wife, uh, a woman who would be uh, uh, young enough so he could mold into her uh, into his own. And he was introduced to this young half Abyssinian, half German student come teacher at the missionary school. He took an instant liking to her and he proposed to her straight away. Um, and after some, some thought, uh, the, uh, the young uh, Bamba Muller uh, accepted the proposal, thinking it would be God's will that she should marry the Maharaja who had been newly converted into the Christian religion. And she agreed to marry him. So the Maharaja told the mission school to prepare his new bride for marriage. For after carrying out the duties of a son in India, he will come back and marry his new bride. So the Maharaja went off to India. Um, again, wasn't allowed to go to the Punjab, so he went to uh, Bombay. Uh, and on the, rivers, uh, on the river Godabri at Nazik, he cremated um, his mother's remains. And in June 1864, he returned to Cairo and he married his new bride. She couldn't speak English, so she said her vows in Arabic. He spoke them in English. Uh, they had a, a short a honeymoon in Ramlia for two, for two weeks. And after two weeks, they returned back to Cairo. And um, with some recent research, the Maharaja purchased this boat, which was called the Ibis. 
Now, the ibis the Maharaja purchased was solely for the purpose of his wife's missionary work. And every year they would go to Cairo and travel along the Nile and distribute Bibles uh, along the Nile. And after the Maharaja obviously fell out with the establishment, he actually donated the boat to the mission school. And the boat had actually stayed at the mission school for over a hundred years. It was used as a, a coffee shop and library. And only in 2017, it was decommissioned because it, it had become a rust bucket. Um, so it's, it survived over, over 150 years. So the Maharaja took his new bride back to, to Britain. And as his um, newly purchased Elvedon estate, the, the uh, renovation works were still ongoing. He took his wife to his Scottish retreat in Orchardine in Scotland. Here, the Maharani gave birth to their first child, a baby boy. But sadly, after two days, the baby passed away. And the grief-stricken couple had a very private and small uh, funeral in the confines of Kenmore Church. Um, it's been restored now. This grave was, um, it was actually restored by the Sikh community uh, in 2015. And the railings have now been removed. And it's, um, and, and, and it's, it's a lovely little village right uh, next to Loch Ty. And here we have Elverdon Hall. And this is how Elverdon Hall looked when the Maharaja purchased the house. Uh, it was known as Admiral Keppel's Hall. And the Maharaja spent thousands and thousands of pounds on this house, which he borrowed from the India office, and these loans were secured on the house. So the Maharaja was also getting himself into debt, and he was told that on his death, the house would need to be sold to pay for those loans. So when the Maharaja finished the, the, finished the extensive renovation works, the house looked like this. And we can just see the Maharaja's Sikh valet standing there, Arul Singh, outside the newly built Elverdon Hall. And here we can see a, a plan of the house, a floor plan, the hall in the center, the servants' quarters on the left-hand side. And these have all gone now, these have all been demolished. Uh, an aviary that the Maharaja built for exotic, exotic birds from all over the world. The Maharaja was a, a keen falconer as well and um, kept um, birds from Europe as well and the fountains he laid out on the right-hand side. The Maharaja wanted Elverdon to be his own Indian palace. He wanted it to be reminiscent of the fine Mughal palaces he was accustomed to as a young boy in India. And he sent out architects to visit India to get ideas of how the interior of such a house should be. And he even consulted photographs by the very well-known Victorian photographers, Bourne and Shepherd. And here we see some of the, um, the workforce at Elverdon. We have the, the Maharaja's Sikh valet, uh, Arul Singh, and members of the, the Mays family. And I'm actually um, honored to say that we have one of the Mays family here today, uh, the great grandson of, is it John, John James Mays, the, the head gamekeeper. And the, the Mays family uh, for several generations worked for the Deep Singhs and they were housekeepers, maids, gamekeepers, and I believe Margaret Mace was also a governess for Princess Sophia at one point. Um, I did read it. In 1880. So that was James's daughter, who I think is this lady here, is it? Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's her. Right. And here we see the Maharaja Dalip Singh um, at a hunting party. There's the Maharaja, and here's the Prince of Wales. The Prince of Wales was actually meant to visit um, in 1871. Uh, but due to that, due to having a fatal illness that year, the trip was put forward to 1872 when he came with uh, the Princess of Wales and also his two sons, George and, and Albert. The, the, the Prince of Wales again visited um, in 1873 um, and in 1876 there was this grand hunting party, which is legendary in, in many of the record books and, and hunting books that we can get today. Here's the Maharaja and here's the Prince of Wales. And such was the shooting at that time that the Prince of Wales wrote a letter to his equerry. And I'm going to read a, a paragraph uh, from that letter he wrote. The Prince of Wales stated, he said, we had the most extraordinary good day shooting, having killed yesterday and today close on 6,000 head, nearly 4,500 of which were pheasants. It is certainly the most wonderful shooting I ever saw, and I doubt whether such bags have ever been made before. Now, Tom Turner, who was a, um, a gamekeeper on the Elverdon estate and wrote a book many years later, mentioned, I remember seeing the Maharaja partridge shooting at Elverdon. It was 1875. I was a young boy 
And these were the days of muzzle loaders. And the Maharaja with his three double barrel guns, two loaders who with their blue and green waistcoats and powder flasks, leather shoot bags made a great impression on my mind. The Maharaja held two outstanding shooting records, which still stand today. Uh, the first record was 440 grouse to his own gun in Perthshire in 1871. And the second record was on this particular shoot in 1876, where the Maharaja bagged 780 for 1,000 cartridges expended, rated as the largest bag ever made by one gun in England. And the Maharaja was of the opinion that had the hand rear birds been available to him on this day, he would have shot between 1,400 and 2,000. A good season at Elverdon consisted of 9,600 pheasants, 9,400 partridges, 3,000 hares, and 75,000 rabbits. The ladies too had their parties, and here we see Maharani Bamba Dalip Singh having a tennis party at Elverdon with their two sons, Victor and Frederick, who we can see uh, with their hair open. They kept their hair long until they were teenagers. And as the Maharaja and Maharani moved to Elverdon, the house began to fill with children. And here we can see the Maharani with five of their children. She's holding the youngest, Sophia. Uh, and we've got uh, Frederick, Victor, Catherine, and Bamba. So here we see the Maharajas of six children. Now, Victor Dalip Singh was the, the eldest son. He was a godson of Queen Victoria. Um, we, well, in my early research, we always thought Victor was a bit of a waste of space because he was a, he was an, a gambler. And he was a failure in the army. He was constantly getting into debt and uh, his brother was always having to bail him out. But some recent research, which I'm not gonna share with you today because we've just done a documentary with Channel 4 and it's gonna be shown on the 15th of August. And some really interesting research has come out about Victor's private activities, which shows that he was not a total failure that we, we all thought he was. Prince Frederick, the second son of the Maharaja, who was a, um, a historian, an archeologist, um, he saved many buildings um, and churches um, in the local town, in the local county uh, from closure. Princess Bamba, the oldest daughter, who outlived her entire family um, and died at the age of 89 in Lahore in 1957. Princess Catherine de Leipzig, the second daughter, the very quiet daughter who actually lived most of her life in Germany. Um, we later discovered that she saved many Jewish families from the Holocaust in the Second World War and housed them and gave them refuge um, in her house in Buckinghamshire. And in 1997, uh, when the Swiss Banking Association um, released a list of Swiss dormant accounts since the war, Princess Catherine's name was one of those bank accounts which had been held. So a very secret and private lady and a lot of revelations came out later. And the youngest uh, daughter was Sophia, uh, the famous suffragette who was known for uh, chaining herself to the gates of Hampton Court. Um, we've actually got a film director here today who's actually looking to make a film on Sophia, so we're going to be looking forward to that. And the youngest, uh, Prince Edward Albert, um, who died at the age of 12 years old uh, when he had a subsiding of his stomach. Uh, some portraits of the, of the children. Uh, Prince Victor the Leap Singh, painted by George Richmond, the same artist who painted uh, Maharani Jinda when she came in 1863. And on the right, uh, again, Prince Victor, painted by Sidney Pryor. And this was actually painted on the Maharaja's 13th birthday. It was commissioned by the Maharaja and it was done as a gift to his godmother, Queen Victoria. Uh, and it now hangs at Osborne House in the Isle of Wight. Some photographs of the sisters. Um, the, the, the one on the left, we can see Edward, the young Edward sitting with his sisters. Probably one of the last photographs of little Edward with his sisters before he died. Uh, we have uh, Bamba, Catherine, Sophia, and then we have the three sisters on their deputants ball in May 1895, when they were formally presented at the court of Queen Victoria at Buckingham Palace. And the original portrait is actually in the exhibition, which um, you can look at uh, outside. So we have Bamba, Sophia and Catherine at the back. And here we have Sophia the Leap Singh. So apart from her suffragette activities, she also uh, was a nurse during the First World War. Um, she was actually, um, she looked tender to the, 
wounded Indian soldiers who were convalescing in the hospitals at Brighton uh, in Sussex, and also gathered um, funds for the um, wounded soldiers who uh, were in the um, Sussex hospitals. And very recently, when, they, when we celebrated the 100th anniversary of Votes for Women, Princess of Fire Dalip Singh was actually featured on a postage stamp issued by Royal Mail. Uh, she had her own stamp and she's shown here selling the suffragette newspaper outside of Hampton Court, uh, where she lived. And Prince Frederick Dalip Singh, who was a, a benefactor to, to, to the local area, he saved many churches uh, around the county, uh, including the churches at Bradley, at uh, Wyndham, uh, St. Swithin's, Thompson. He even uh, oversaw the restoration work at Norwich Cathedral. Um, he was a, a great believer uh, of a great believer that places of worship should never close. He also founded the, the museum at, uh, at Bedford, the Tudor House, which he purchased and, and gave to the town. And um, he also um, wrote many books uh, on local history, um, a lot of articles um, on um, Norfolk portraits. Uh, again, copies of the articles and the books are on display in the exhibition. And here we can see Vanity Fair mimicking the Maharaja's fast dwindling appearance towards the early 1880s, with a pot belly, uh, receding hairline, and a cigarette hanging outside his mouth. So the Maharaja's um, pension of 40 to 50 thousand pounds per annum was never given in full. At best, he received between 15 to 25. The British India office felt that was more than enough for him uh, to live a comfortable life. But the Maharaja was finding it difficult to bring up uh, an, a, a huge estate and um, six children. And he asked for a trial into his financial affairs and that his pension should be brought in line with the treaty of um, annexation when the Punjab was annexed. And for years, the British East India office had also promised the Maharaja to compensate him for all his possessions which were left behind in India when he came here in 1854, because he left all his possessions behind and he was meant to go back. Uh, but the mutiny happened in India and his house in India was ransacked by the mutineers and all his, his, his belongings, his treasures and his family possessions were all burnt down. And he argued for uh, the compensation, which he never received. So the Maharaja became disillusioned uh, by his surroundings and he started delving into his um, private estates in the Punjab. And he instructed his cousin, Thakur Singh Sandawalia, who's in the centre here, to look into his um, family's private estates. Now in 1884, Thakur Singh left for Amritsar with his three sons and a Sikh priest from the Golden Temple to visit the Maharaja with some interesting news. Now he told the Maharaja that at the time of the annexation, the Maharaja's personal family possessions had been illegally confisc confiscated with state property. So this was the Maharaja's uh, personal lands and estates, which had belonged to Ranjit Singh well before he had come to the throne of the Punjab and was seen as their personal family properties and not state property. The Maharaja once again asked for a trial uh, with the India office, uh, pleading with the British government. Again, he was rejected. The Maharaja decided enough was enough. And he thought, oh, well, I'm going to pack my bags. I'm going to take my family and I'm going to head back to India. And the second reason why he wanted to head back to India, because he was told that when he would die, his house at Elverden would also be sold to pay for the loans that were secured on it. And the Maharaja felt just the way that he had been turned away from his house when his father died, he would also be, his children would also be turned away when he died. So he sold all his possessions at Elverden, packed his bags with his children, took a steamer and headed to India. When the ship docked at halfway at Aden, the Maharaja was, was arrested by the British resident. He was told that he could not proceed to India due to the security of the empire. To save face, the Maharaja sent his wife and his children back to England, and he stayed in Aden himself to have one last stand against the British authorities. Now, his first act of defiance was to call upon his cousins in the Punjab to come and visit him at Aden, where he was reinitiated into the Sikh faith. And the Maharaja became a Sikh. But during the summer months, the Maharaja fell ill with the hot weather. The British doctor at Aden felt the Maharaja must be moved to a cooler climate, as it would have been terrible had he died under British house arrest. So he was told in very stern words, he could go anywhere in Europe, 
But if he attempted to go to India again, he would certainly be arrested and very harsh steps would be taken against him. The Maharaja headed for France. He went to Paris uh, via Marseille. And when he arrived in Paris, a whole array of dissatisfied anti-British organizations contacted the Maharaja. We had the, the Irish Fenians, uh, agents of the Russian, Russian Tsar, the French underworld, and even German intelligence was keeping an eye on the Maharaja's activities in Paris. Little did the Maharaja know that Colonel Tevis, an Irish Fenian, a well-respected Irish Fenian um, who was working and plying his tra trade in Paris, was actually a double agent working for the British. And his original job was to spy on the Irish Fenians in Paris. But when the Maharaja arrived in Paris, he was told to get employment within the Maharaja's household. And he became the Maharaja's private secretary. He was actually even given a reference by the Fenians saying, this chap's more than trustworthy uh, to work for you. From that point, every letter, every communication, every meeting that the Maharaja had was copied in and sent to London's Whitehall. The British office knew his every move. And the Maharaja never knew this till, till the end. So right up to his death, he never knew that his trusted personal secretary, Colonel Tevis, was actually the spy which had been planted on him. And uh, these um, documents were actually released 100 years after the Maharaja's death. Uh, and Christy Campbell in his book released some of these letters which were filed under OC, meaning our correspondent. And when he tracked back to Tevis's bank accounts, we found the sum of money which were leaving the foreign office going into Tevis's bank account. So that verified that Tevis was the spy. So Tevis told the Maharaja that the Maharaja should come to Russia and that the Russian king, the Tsar of Russia, would give the Maharaja 20,000 soldiers to march into India via Afghanistan. And when the Indian army would be sent to oppose them, the Sikhs, the Sikhs in the Indian army would come to the Maharaja's side. And the Irish Fenians would get the Irish regiments in the British Indian army to rebel at the rear. It was a ludicrous plan. It was never going to happen. Plus, the British knew his every move. The British press in England was mocking his activities in Europe. Here we have the punch cartoon showing Colonel, sorry, Colonel Katkov dressed as the Russian bear playing the flute and Maharaja Dulip Singh dressed as the Irishman Patrick Casey dancing to his every tune. The Maharaja arrived in Russia and when the Maharaja arrived, he discovered that Katkov was mysteriously poisoned. A week later, he was told Thakur Singh Sundarwalia, his cousin in Amritsar, who had been detained by the British for gathering support for the Maharaja, was also poisoned whilst under detention. The Maharaja was heartbroken. His mission in Russia had failed even before it had started. He headed back to Paris. And when he arrived in Paris, he was told that his wife, Bamba, Maharani Bamba, had died in London after a short illness. The, the Maharaja now married his mistress, who had accompanied him to, um, to Russia. And they had two children, uh, Pauline and Irene. So we see, uh, this is Sophia, the youngest daughter from the first marriage. And here we see Pauline and Irene. And here we see Ada, who became Maharani Ada. So the, the couple married. Uh, and in 1890, um, when he came back to Paris, the Maharaja uh, suffered a stroke. He was barely able to pick up a pen. He asked his son Victor to come and visit him in Paris, and he asked him to pen a letter to Queen Victoria, asking for an apology, asking uh, for, for a pardon. The following year, in 1891, the Queen visited the south of France, and she gave the Maharaja an audience. The Maharaja fell to her feet. He wept, uh, and a royal pardon was given to the Maharaja, uh, much to the dismay of her ministers. She still had affection for her favorite Indian prince. The Maharaja did come back to England once more, and that was to visit his ailing son, Prince Edward Albert Dalip Singh, who had a, a subsiding of his stomach and was on his deathbed um, at Folkestone. And we always believed that the Maharaja actually died a Sikh, so he had um, reconverted back into Sikhism. But towards the end of his life, we now know from new research that the Maharaja lapsed in Sikhism and went back to Christianity. And one of those evidences is that when his son was on his deathbed, the Maharaja placed a, a verse from the Bible, the Lord is my shepherd, in the palm of his son's hands. He also changed his, his own will, and he requested 
uh, that he be buried rather than cremated. Um, and there were several letters which we've discovered um, recently where the Maharaj has actually said that I've now become a Christian again. And his su annual subscription to the missionary school in Cairo also started back up again before his death. So he left his ailing son on his deathbed and went back to Paris because the Maharaja himself uh, was suffering from a, a stroke. Uh, and a couple of weeks later, the young Prince Edward Albert uh, passed away um, all on his own. On the 21st of October, 1893, all alone in his hotel room in Paris, um, the Maharaja suffered an epileptic fit. He lingered unconscious for a, another day and he was found the following morning um, at death. His, um, his sons had uh, brought his, his sons decided to bring his body back to Elverdon and he was uh, buried uh, beside his wife Bamba and his young son Edward Albert. Elverdon Hall um, was sold a year after his death. The trustees uh, of the India office sold the hall to the, the Guinness family, um, Lord Iver, the same family which owns the house today. So the Maharaja's portion, so this, the central dome we see in the house is actually an addition that Lord Iver built in 1901. And the Maharaja's section is this section here on the left. So the right wing, again, was built by Lord Iver. And many of you may have seen many films uh, where the house is featured in, such as uh, Tom Cruise's Eyes Wide Shut, that's shown um, in the central uh, hall of Elverdon. Uh, it also has the Indian marble decoration, uh, but Lord Ivers was the actual real McCoy. It was actually the real marble, whereas the Maharajas was all plaster work. So most of the, the pictures we see of the hall are actually Lord Ivers work, which he replicated from the Maharajas wing uh, from the left hand side. Ironically, in 1999, the current Prince of Wales uh, unveiled a statue uh, to the Maharaja in Button Island in Thetford. Um, the, the Maharaja always had a strong link to the Prince of Wales, the, the then Prince of Wales, Edward uh, VII. Uh, and this was unveiled by Prince Charles. And in 2016, we had the, the first uh, Hollywood feature film um, on Maharaja the Leap Singh called The Black Prince which sadly didn't do too well uh, in the cinema. It was shown in Norfolk for a time, um, but what the film did, it did show an outline of the Maharaja's um, life in some small way. Um, and there was a, a launch which was done at the Light Cinema in Thetford. And I believe that's my final slide. I do have uh, some of my books here with me, which um, I'd be happy to, which were selling at a discounted price, and I'd be happy to um, sign any copies if you wish to have one. Thank you very much. Thank you.